Good morning, and welcome to this time of worship. We gather, but we are also called to wait in this season of Advent. Waiting is hard. Waiting is not something we normally like to do, and yet we are called to this season of waiting. On this final chapter in our series of chapel sermons this fall, we are thankful and privileged to have our seminary president, Jeff Carter, bring the message for us today. We also realize that in this season of waiting, we are peering towards the end of this semester, and so we also sense a lot of anticipation in the room. Anticipation of completed assignments and courses. In that spirit, would you please rise and join with me as we are called into this time of worship. Behold, God is good and has set a star in the heavens to guide us to the truth. We follow it with joy, knowing that God will give us strength to climb the hills and sight to conquer the darkness. Behold, God is good and has promised us a savior to lead us to righteousness. We await the Savior's coming with gladness and with expectation that in the holy birth our lives may be renewed. And join with me, your hearts together with mine in prayer, if you would. Giver of light, who breaks all yokes of oppression, we rejoice at the words of your promise reminding us that all oppression is a violation of your purposes. We welcome the embodiment of the peace of the babe of Bethlehem. May the little child lead us and our nation to embrace those attitudes and actions that lead to true peace. Peace that brings equity and opportunity for all as we join our hearts and our minds in joyous worship this day, ready us to serve your peaceful purposes in the days that will follow. Amen. I invite you to turn your hymnals to number 178 and we'll sing together that opening hymn.
Our scripture text for this morning comes from the second chapter of Luke, the first eight verses. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went to the town of Nazareth in Galilee, to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in thee. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by. Yet in the dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. There is a controversy brewing just outside of Charlottesville, Virginia. Among the rolling hills and the sweeping rural vistas, there atop a lofty hill in Albemarle County sits Monticello the 18th century home of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, you know Thomas Jefferson, the third president of this, these United States, vice president to John Adams, first secretary of state, the appointed minister to France, inventor, businessman, planter, lawyer, politician, and yes, the author of the Declaration of Independence. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Visitors to Monticello, after passing through the gardens and beside the covered walkways, move up a wide brick staircase approaching the house. Upon entering the residence, guests move between large, iconic white columns through a large doorway and then across the threshold and into the main entrance hall. Two stories above the entrance hall sits the dome room beneath that iconic rounded roof. Yes, by all appearances, a reminder of Rome and its architecture is the place where visitors hear stories of Jefferson. Jefferson as the inventor, the swiveled chair, an improved iron plow much lighter than its predecessors, the polygraph for copying signatures, the dumbwaiter, and the macaroni machine. Yes, a machine to make pasta. Guess here of Jefferson, the politician, the president, the vice president, the secretary of state, the ambassador. And to hear stories of Jefferson, the slave owner. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Jefferson owned some 600 African-American slaves throughout his adult life. He freed two slaves while he lived and seven more after his death. Historians note some were his own children. He consistently spoke out against the international slave trade. He called it an abominable crime. He advocated gradual emancipation, and yet he was a lifelong slaveholder. 
The story of Jefferson as a slaveholder has moved from the backfields of Monticello to the very near narrative of his story. And for the last 25 years, stories from descendants of Jefferson's own slaves have been collected as a way of filling in the fullness of Monticello. The project is entitled Getting Word. It's an embodiment of how stories are shared generation to generation to generation, getting word from one across a generation to another, getting word as to the who and the what and the where and the when. Stories from the field and the kitchen and the ironwork, stories from the cotton fields and the barn and the silo, stories to include the family of Sally Hemings. Stories to include the family of Sally Hemings, a family that makes sure that in every generation, a girl is named Sally as a way of remembering the woman who, after the death of Jefferson's wife, Martha, bore him six children. Herein lies this brewing controversy at Monticello. Visitors to Monticello, learning of these stories, leave somewhat conflicted, some downright angry over what is a mixed bag. Confusion over words inscribed in our founding father's documents and yet unrealized in the fields or in the home of the one who penned them. Issues of morality and how some children born into privileged home could remain in slavery until Jefferson's death. Maybe the anger, anger comes from simple disillusionment. The pieces just don't add up, or maybe they do. Jefferson himself suffered from disillusionment, for he held great hope and promise in the power of institutions, more specifically, the institutions of education and government. In establishing the University of Virginia, the iconic rotunda with its large white columns mirrors his Monticello home. His highest values were literally embedded in the very foundation of the school, and yet, there were approximately 100 enslaved people living in and working around the grounds of the university. They were essential to the operation. While the classroom provided a refined and enlightened education, life outside the classroom mirrored more the plantation. Enlightened words of equality did little to reform the culture beyond the pen, and in fact, it did much to reinforce the power, the privilege, and the preservation of an old and segregated way a way that moved from the classroom and bled into the new democracy, where slaves were counted as three-fifths a person, and Native Americans were not counted at all. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free, from our fears and sin, release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Counting people. <laughs> Counting people. Or shall I say, qualifying and quantifying people. It's actually nothing new, and it's not even old. It's rather ancient. It's in this very gospel text that we read here at the beginning of Advent. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Immediately in hearing this text, we know it is the Gospel of Luke. Who is to be registered? All the world. Some? No. Part? No. All the world. For whom does Jesus come? for all the world. All the world is to be registered. All, is the all of the world is to be counted. A census in that day identified and located and numbered people in particular groups for three main purposes, taxation, conscription, and forced labor. This registration in Luke is a bit curious, for Luke gives a number of historical identifiers, but to be honest, they don't line up. Yes, Quirinius was governor. And yes, Quirinius had a registration, but not at the time of Jesus' birth. It probably occurred some 11 years after today's story. And this story is actually more Jewish than it is Roman, for the Roman system did not require people to return to one's place of birth or family origin 
people and property were registered where they were located. And Mary, Mary would not have had to accompany Joseph. And yet Luke speaks of registration, Bethlehem, and Mary. All requirements for this census story. So why? What are we counting? And who's doing the counting? Most likely, Luke is simply noting important historical markers as a way of telling a story and not writing a history book, an important delineation. Emperor Augustus was widely acclaimed as the bringer of peace, and yet Luke, in verse 14, records the angel's proclamation at the birth of Jesus, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among those he favors. Peace on earth. So then who is the real bearer of peace, according to Luke? And this registration as Jesus born in the city of David, Bethlehem, and then returning to Nazareth in Galilee, where he will grow into a man, thus affirming the prophecy for the first Messiah. He is from the lineage of David. And who is with Mary? Or who is with Joseph? I gave you the answer. Mary. And she's pregnant. Not needed for the registration, but critical for a birth story. You have to have a pregnant woman for a birth. In other words, this registration is not about numbers, but about adding up the significance of Jesus and his birth. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, born into the city of David, to a virgin whose name is Mary. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. And in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. And the story of Jesus' birth is quite simple. In fact, in Luke's gospel, it is about a single verse. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. What I find amazing about Bethlehem is while Luke tells of a count occurring where a city was full of those being numbered, so many that the only room was that of a stable for Mary and Joseph, there was another count occurring. In the quiet of the night, in a feeding trough, a manger, a new count begins. Not for taxation, or for conscription, or for possible labor, but accounting of all the world and our worth. And it begins not with the powerful or the privileged or the prosperous, but with shepherds living in a field. Shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night. Do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom God favors. This is not Caesar Augustus counting, qualifying quantifying for his purpose. This counting is of God, and the news travels first to the fields. For Jesus, it will include those who hunger and thirst are imprisoned and are lonely. It will include male and female, slave and free, Jew and Gentile. For Jesus, it will call from the shadows those who are tormented, diseased, and unclean. He will focus on the forgotten and the neglected, the poor and the widow and the orphan, all counted and precious in his sight. You see, in speaking of who is valued, it matters who is counting and who is being counted. And so, therefore, his first sermon, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim, proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. While Thomas Jefferson placed his faith in the institutions of education and government as agents of change, often being trapped by the vices of both, 
Writer Virginia Woolf writes of her distrust of institutions in her book, Free Guineas. As Stephanie Polson writes in Christian Century, Woolf distrusted public rituals, religious or political, because they were so often used to build up gender hierarchies in place and dictatorships in power. In other words, religious and political rituals, institutions often seek to maintain their own boundaries. I wonder if this is why Sunday morning remains the most segregated hour in America. Wolf wrote at the end of Three Guineas, the human longing for peace and freedom depends upon the capacity of the human spirit to overflow boundaries. It is to move outside our categories and to count worth differently. When my girls were little, they loved to play with our large Hungarian manger scene. The set includes all of the notable characters, many that you'd recognize. There's Mary, there's Joseph, there's Jesus, plus some non-traditional pieces that only a Hungarian set would include, like children on sleds and skiers, characters covered in snow. My three little girls would spend hours setting up the figures, playing with the dolls, rearranging the set, and then the next day, doing it all over again. Some nights as I would move through our living room, headed to the steps, as I was turning off the lights, I'd pass by the set. Often I'd find all of those figures, more numerous than number, lined up as if someone was taking roll before walking away. Counting every figure from the smallest to the largest, from the most notable to the unnamed, they were all there being counted before dream and sleep. Great care and love for each. Clearly, my children were not counting on the institution of parenthood to look after their little figures. They didn't leave it to someone else to place them in order to make sure they were all counted. There were times when one of the girls would arrange and count only to have another girl come behind and rearrange and recount to do it over again to make sure not a single piece was lost. Legos in our house have gone missing. Playmobil sets have lost their parts. But in nearly 20 years, we have not lost a single Hungarian advent figure. And they are numerous. I'm grateful that there is a recounting of stories at Monticello. It is long overdue that all the stories are accounted for to pull from the shadows the rest of the story and those whose lives embody them, but the concern must not be left solely to institutions to work on our behalf. For Christ was born for each of us so that each of us might find life in him. Not life to ourselves, but life for the world. So that there might be peace on earth, a true peace from the Prince of Peace, not a peace through power and privilege and prestige, but a peace through love and compassion and empathy and true fellowship. A seeing and accounting of one another and our worth. A peace without fear or the sin of separation. A peace that is both penetrating and pervasive. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From what our fears and sins release us, let us find our rest in thee, O little town of Bethlehem. How still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in the dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Come, thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free.
Can we join together in prayer once again? O living Christ, you were, you are, you come. Clothe us with garments of celebration that we might be prepared for the feast of your coming reign. Keep us wakeful that our lamps may ever burn in the vigil of your coming. Give us sight that we might indeed recognize the signs of your coming and give us strength to stand in your presence. So may all these things be through your gracious spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our final hymn together, 191, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. 